You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week before we get to this week's episode featuring a former Navy SEAL who made an amazing swim across the English Channel in honor of a fallen teammate. We'll get to that story and a whole lot more coming up in just a moment. Our normal announcements, as always, and I keep repeating them because you guys are not following. You're not following us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground and Hazard Ground Podcast. Tell a friend, tell them to do the same. Certainly appreciate it. Please continue to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Give a thumbs up and a like to the content there. Don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. You go to our website, hazardground.com, and go to the bottom of the homepage. Click on that Amazon button right there. It'll redirect you to Amazon. You can do all of your normal Amazon shopping, whatever you want to buy. We'll get a percentage of what you guys spend, and we'll donate a percentage of that back to some of the charities and organizations you've heard featured on the Hazard Round podcast. Also works from your smartphone, very simple and convenient. So if you've saved all your credit card information, it'll redirect you to the Amazon app. Very, very easy user friendly as well please continue to leave us apple reviews go to apple or wherever you get your podcast leave us that five star rating tell everybody why you love this show we certainly appreciate it uh getting a lot of great feedback from you guys and love sharing it with social media love sharing your feedback on social media as well so we certainly appreciate it um and again continued support of the show thank you guys so much for being part of this hazard ground community all right uh this week's guest is actually somebody that i have had a chance to interview before for a different uh different company but uh, his story is worth absolutely worth telling again. Spent 25 years in the Navy, retired as a captain. 22 of those years were spent inside the Navy SEALs and special operations. His final assignment was in SOCOM, which is the Special Operations Command, as f- part of the preservation of the force and family unit, which takes care of all the people within uh, the, the SOCOM family uh, and making sure that they are okay. And it leads to what he is going to do currently in his post-military career. He completed a swim across the English Channel in honor of a fallen buddy. That buddy is a notable individual who you may know, Neil Roberts, Roberts Ridge, uh, and the story of Tacker Gar. Uh, So he completed that swim in honor of him. And now he's this chief financial officer of Katsu, uh, which is a company that specializes in rehabilitation, but specifically for veterans, neuropathic pain, and dealing with amputees. Here's John Doolittle joining us here on the Hazard Ground Podcast. John, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Hey, Mark, it's awesome to be with you again, man. Thanks for having me on the show. It it is great to be with you. Um, And I I told you this right before we started recording that the inspiration for the Hazard Ground is is the Battle of Tacker Gar. Um, And for those who don't know, Tacker Gar essentially became a battle because of what happened to Neil Roberts. Neil Roberts was the first Navy SEAL killed in the war on terror. Um, the, The short version is he fell out of the back of a helicopter on the top of that mountain, in Afghanistan, and uh, a team of rangers was sent up there to go find him, to go get him, because he was all alone. Um, those rangers were then entrapped in, in, in a battle for about 20 hours on that mountain, outnumbered, outmanned. Not only did Neil Roberts um, get killed in action, but Jason Chapman also, who was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor, Medal of Honor, the Air Force Combat Controller, um, who there are there are videos out there on the internet. Just put it to that way. Of you can see what Jason Chapman was able to do all by himself on that mountaintop as well. So. Some pretty heroic actions. And, you know, the story goes here, John, that um, I remember, you know, in my armory, uh, in my National Guard armory, you know, this is later on in my career. And they had all these paintings, all these like paintings up on the wall of, you know, engagements that National Guard members were involved in over the course of the years. And I kept reading about this, this medic from the Kentucky National Guard who was on top of that mountain, who was running IV bags back and forth, trying to keep people alive you know, in the battle attack or gar. And I'm sitting here going, that's pretty amazing. And so then I was obviously not doing the job that I was supposed to do at drill one weekend. And I started Googling tacker gar, you know, because us officers are always so engaged. Um, And I started Googling it and and I read this whole thing about what went on. I go, why is this not a movie? Why does nobody know about this story? Well, lo and behold, I mean, it was a book. Nate Self, who was a former guest on the Hazard Ground, shared his story uh, of what went on on the top of that mountain. But that's kind of the genesis of, of this whole show is, trying to tell those stories that never were made into movies. And, and yours is certainly part of that. Well, until today, I mean, I've been listening to your stuff for a while and uh, until today, I didn't, I had no idea, man. That's, yeah. uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Fifi was, uh, he was a special guy. <laughs> when I, when I showed up at team two as a new guy, 
there were two guys on the quarter deck and uh, Neil, Neil was one of them. Uh, so he was my, uh, you know, kind of a special mentor. I'm putting that in quotes for those who can't see me uh, early on. So you can imagine new guy officer in his blues checking in seal team two quarter deck. And there's uh, Neil Roberts and a couple other guys. And uh, yeah, I got some special treatment, but over time I became kind of uh, good friends with them and got to know uh, Patty, his wife and Nathan, his son. And um, yeah, that was a, that was a really um, meaningful experience for me doing yeah. that in, mem in memory of him. That's what you get uh, for being the FNG, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Special, man. special, special <laughs> welcome to say the least. All right. Start back at the beginning. Um, how and why you wanted to be a Navy SEAL. Well, you didn't initially, right? You just joined, you signed up for the Navy and then then found out about the SEALs? Yeah, I actually tried to go to the Naval Academy and they said no. And uh, I was a swimmer. And, um, you know, this 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 is back in, I'm dating myself here, but this is in like 80, 87 Top Gun era. And, uh, <laughs> you know, me, me and all my buddies, we want to go fly the jets, my be like to goose and maverick and all that stuff so i applied to the uh, naval academy got shot down and the coach at the air force academy needed a uh, guy that did fly and breast and i was a swimmer and uh one thing led to another and i ended up going to the air force academy but uh <laughs> when, when we were juniors at the academy uh president bush 41 that administration they came out and they said only the top third of the graduating class from 1992, I was a 92 guy, only the top third are going to go to UPT, undergraduate pilot training. And Mark, um, I was definitely not in the top third. And I, I would argue I was not even in the top 98%. I was, uh, I was, I was skating somewhere at the very bottom uh, of my class. So I reached out to our mentor, um, in your last podcast, the guy with the uh, uh, you guys talked about mentorship in the last one. That's that's huge. We can go down that road if you want. But sure, a mentor absolutely. for me was a guy named Mike Troy and former uh, gold medalist, 1960 Olympics, uh, butterfly world record holder. And then after the Olympics in Rome, he joined the Navy and UDT SEAL. Um, or uh, he was UDT initially, went to Vietnam, did three tours in Vietnam. After Nam, came back and became a swim coach. Long story longer, I ended up swimming for Mike. So when I realized I wasn't going to be able to fly, um, I called Mike. And, uh, and Mike, without skipping a beat, he's like, oh, you got to go be a team guy. Get out of the Air Force, go join the Navy. And, uh, and you know, the rest, the rest is history. Yeah. Um, did you know anything about the SEALs, though? Yeah, I knew. <laughs> I didn't know anything operationally about the SEALs because Mike, before workouts, especially those Saturday morning workouts, those ones that would be three or four hours long, and they were just, they're just brutal, man. Um, but before those workouts, he would tell stories. And they were almost always stories about the teams. And uh, the team stories that he would tell wouldn't be about Vietnam ever. He'd never talk about that, but he would talk about training and he would talk about buds and he'd talk about hell week. And he talked about all the shit he did in the training to be become a team guy. And uh, they were, they were great. They were so motivational and it would uh, just get us through tough, tough, you know, physical times. And that was the beginning of my, uh, I don't know, my understanding that no matter how hard something seems, you can always do a little more than you, yeah. than you think you can. How powerful the mind is. I got all that from Mike, Mike Troy, or I got a lot of that from him. Well, I, I mean, it's it's kind of the old, or not old, but the ideology that, um, you know, things don't get easier. You just deal with hard shit better, right? Like, right. Right. it's navy seal mantra the only easy day was yesterday right so it, it, you're 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 used to dealing with hard stuff and and that's kind of the, the whole idea but i'm curious because you know um shared experience is one thing but you know verbally him telling you oh this is what we did this is what we did and then you get to buds where you're like oh he's full of shit like oh my dad he was so misleading in what he told me or was he like dead on accurate like was it was it was it, was it everything he said it was going to be no it was actually uh 
it was it was impressive how accurate it all was. <laughs> all the stories he told, I was like, oh my god, this this is just like I remember it with with what Mike was was talking about. And uh, as a result, um, Buds was a uh, <laughs> you made fun of me for saying this last time, but. I, I firmly, I stand by it. The best time I had in the Navy uh, was at Bud's with, with all my, uh, with all my teammates. I mean, those guys became, some of those guys are my best friends on the planet. And uh, you know, they do anything for me. I do anything for them. And um, while it was hard uh, physically, um, when you, when you're when, when with a bunch of guys going through something tough, together there is some um, magic in that and uh you know I, I was in the fleet for a little while as a salvage diver i was on junk boat and so i knew that part of the navy <laughs> and, and i knew that i did not want to go back to that part, that part of the navy, of the navy. yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, buds was the best part of my life is akin to that colonoscopy i was awake for was my favorite time ever so uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that alone it is uh, that said, you know, I, I always ask this question of SEALs about BUDS um, because I'm, I'm just genuinely curious. And I think the experience for everybody is different. I've gotten a variety of different answers. What was harder about BUDS for you, the mental or the physical? Because I've found in talking to a lot of guys that, you know, some guys were just built to handle the physical, right? Their bodies were, were built to handle it all and they had mm -hmm. to struggle with the mental. And some guys are the exact opposite. Mentally, they could handle everything, but it was the swims. It was to get Sandy. It was the, you know, the, the physical stuff that wore them down so much um, that they were struggling mentally. Which one was it for you? Oh, I mean, the, the, the mental part is by far the hardest at Bud's, by far. And when you talk to people that say the opposite, uh, I would say, you know, they just weren't physically ready for that kind of uh, beating on their body. Uh, and I'm sure there's some people that feel that way, but uh, for me, oh man, it, it was the mental challenge. Um, but you know, what you learn there is your, your mind is so, so incredibly powerful. Your mind's more powerful than, than your body uh, for sure. In my, in my opinion, but um, yeah, you know, er everybody gets through that part of their career um, differently. Uh, for me, it was just putting in my mind that I was not going to quit. I might get medically dropped. I might uh, get kicked out, but I was not uh, I was not going to ring the bell. No, absolutely. Um, and then one more on Buds, because you, you brought it up. That's the other one. You know, ringing that bell, what did it do for you? Because I, I know that there were some guys you never thought would ring the bell that did. Uh, and then there were other guys you looked around and be like, how did that guy get this far? He should have rung the bell a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I actually, it's kind of cool. I did get to ring the bell when we graduated. I was graduated the, uh, right, yeah. Oh yeah. I was the class officer. So I got to go up on the stage, say a few words and, uh, and then ring the class out. That was, that was kind of cool. But, um, I mean, we, we, we had some, uh, college stud athletes, um, in our, in our class, we had some wrestlers, some, we had, uh, arena football we had a pro hockey player we had all kinds of stud physical specimens in our classes same in every class you have all shapes and sizes and uh yeah you know you, you'd look at one guy that was just physically incredible and yet second day of hell week he's ringing the bell and he's gone so um yeah I, you know no 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 real rhyme or reason to it um you really you really do get all shapes and sizes making it through um but i think the reason for that is because it is such more mental thing than the physical thing all right so uh you finish buds you get to the team what year month are we talking when you first arrive at the teams because this is all pre-9-11 obviously still yeah so it's 96 when i got to uh team two did you and uh go ahead i'm sorry no, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, did you like, there's nothing going on in the world. Like obviously in the special operations world, there's always something going on. Right. But you know, and you have this, uh, this indoctrination, as you talked about a little bit, you know, of being the FNG and, and, you know, going through some of the things and learning the team life and all that. But what's the operational tempo like when you get there and what are you expecting it to be like? 
Uh, the op tempo was basically 18 months of workup training, and that included your leave, your professional development, your unilateral training, your team training, whatever interaction training you're going to do with the fleet or the Marines or whoever you're going to be with. That piece was 18 months, and then the deployment was six months. So when I came into the teams, it was this kind of magic 24-month cycle. And then once you were done with that 24 months, rinse and repeat. That was kind of the – and it was a little bit different at some of the teams. Of course, the National Mission Force was was very different, but it was kind of a three-in-one um, before 9-11. And um, after 9-11, as you can imagine, sure. uh, oof, everything changed. I mean, let me, let, let me ask you, was there yeah. anything sig- – I don't want to gloss over that part of your career like it, it did matter because I think everything is formative to a certain extent. Was there ever, anything prior to 9-11 that, that was significant to you? Was, was there a seminal moment or anything prior to 9-11, whether it was in training or an exercise or whatever it may be, that <sighs> Um, I mean, the, the, the first real operational stuff I did was, uh, in Kosovo. Okay. Um, I really wasn't part of Bosnia. I did go in and out of Bosnia that. later on, but yeah, yeah, I mean, Kosovo. yeah, the Bosnia was going on and in Kosovo was kind of that call it combat reconnaissance, you know, put combat in quotes because it was all reconnaissance. It was just confirm or deny uh, things that were going on across the border with Serbia, Albania, Macedonia and all that. That that's and and that was kind of the wake up call for me to the value of buds because you'd go on these missions and they'd be 48, 72, sometimes 96 hours. And you definitely wouldn't sleep on those things. If you did, they were just tiny, tiny cat naps. And, uh, you know, relied on that whole uh, Hell Week perspective of being able to uh, operate on very little sleep. Um, was there a, a seminal moment, like you said? Not, not necessarily, but that idea that uh, all those missions we did in Kosovo, that was kind of a wake-up call for me. Like, oh, shit, this stuff's, this stuff's kind of hard. <laughs> At least I thought it was hard then. Um, and then, you know, as, as you can imagine, after 9-11, everything got exponentially more difficult. All right. Uh, where are you on 9-11? Uh, I was actually at Comp, Camp uh, Camp Bonsteel in uh, the southern portion of Kosovo. Okay. Uh, what are you guys thinking? I mean, who are the guys who are excited? Uh, <laughs> and who are the guys like, oh, God, no, I mean, this is, you know. Because I know there was a crew of guys like, hey, we're going, like, tomorrow, we're leaving. So, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, kid, I say that jokingly. I would never make a joke about 9-11. But, in, you know, the, the reaction from you and, and your teammates is what? Oh, I, I mean, I hate, I, I, I hate to say we were um, excited, to use that word. Uh, everybody was in, in shock, of course. Sure, yeah. Um, but – that uh, deep-seated realization that all of our lives just changed. Yep. Um, there was a crazy energy um, that came with that. And it affected everybody in, in different ways. Um, I mean, right out of the gate, we thought, oh, my God, we're, a C5 is going to land up at uh, Pristina. We're getting on it, and we are going to the show. That's where everybody's mind was. Of course, it didn't, it didn't work out that way. Um, not, not right away, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was, a, a high energy time. I don't want to say an exciting time because there was a lot of uncertainty and, um, but it was definitely high energy, high adventure. So how long did it take for the adventure to actually begin? I mean, how long do you stay in Kosovo? When do you get back to, you know, home base and, and what's going on? What, what's next? Well, at the time, I'm a I'm a lieutenant at Team Two. I'm the OIC of a platoon, and uh, you know you like to think you 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 know what's going on operationally and strategically. And uh, I look back on it, and I really had no freaking clue, man. Um, I thought we would be going to Afghanistan in months, weeks, days, and the reality was we finished our entire deployment at Kosovo, and then we went to Egypt 
for a pre-planned exercise. And I look back on it now and it's like, oh, okay, these exercises take hundreds of millions of dollars to pull together with NATO partners, non-NATO partners consolidating on them. I mean, to stop something like that, I understand now that, you know, that's a big deal. But back then, it was very frustrating. It was like, God, man, we are deployed. Let's go. And it didn't work out like that. Um, I did not step foot in Afghanistan until uh, 2010. And I didn't do my first deployment in Iraq till uh, 2006. So, you know, it's funny. It's funny how it all plays out. I was definitely not one of the earlier guys in the in the conflict, even though I was deployed when it happened. The, um, the it, it, I've talked about this a lot, but you know, and, and I see it now too. Like you know, um, as in 06, you start to see the tactical, operational, strategic uh, levels and and what goes into each one and uh, right. why things are the way they are. You know, and and to a certain extent, I, I think we do a bad job at explaining to tactical guys, company commanders down at the lowest level, um, what to do and why to do it and what it feeds into and, and how it all is part of a bigger plan and a bigger picture. Um, one, because most of them, I don't think they care. I think they care more about the result. Like you, it was just about you getting in the shit. It was get, get boots on ground and let's go, uh, which right. is a very tactical mindset, which I understand. But, um, you know, I, I think that there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a way to, sit those people down in a room before they go into an engagement to understand, um, mm-hmm. you know, how it fits into one another, because I, th- I think it changes some of your decision-making along the line. Not everything is in the tunnel vision vacuum of win the fight in front of me, which is always important. I would never diminish that concept, right. Of, of being tactically sound on the ground, winning the battle mm-hmm. in front of you, you know, keeping all your, your, your folks alive and, 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 you know, having a decisive advantage, um, militarily, which is, you know, important for us. So, but again, I, 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 I say all that long winded BS just to, you know, echo the point that I think you understand now that you didn't. So you're bouncing around from Egypt, to all these other places. I mean, is there a part of you that's like thinking one, the war is going to pass me by, which was now laughable in retrospect. Um, <laughs> and then two, you know, why are we not getting in the fight sooner? What's going on? Like what, what are the steps leading you up to 06 in Iraq? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of it was kind of frustrating, you know. I got I got back from that deployment. Um, then I went to uh, Germany. I was the ops officer at our unit in Stuttgart, Germany, and uh, still at that point had not been in combat. And I'm watching a lot of my friends going. So it was uh, it was a little bit of a struggle for me personally. Um, I went from uh, unit two out to NPS, Naval Postgraduate School. And that was killing me. I still had not been downrange. I used to talk to my uh, a lot of my buddies about this. Um, that is really what drove me to call my Troy in frustration out of uh, when I was out at NPS because Fifi had been killed at that point. And uh, and I asked Mike, I'm like, God, man, I'm, I'm going insane. I'm, I got my nose in the freaking books and. A lot of my teammates are downrange, getting after it, doing what doing what SEALs are supposed to do. And that's what drove me to uh, uh, do the, the channel swim in memory of, uh, of Neil, to pay it back in a different way, to help right. raise uh, money, resources, awareness for at that time, we had only lost a few people. And uh, but we all knew what what was coming. And uh, the UDT SEAL Association and the Navy SEAL Foundation had very little funds at the time. So that's why I did the swim to help do that, raise awareness and all that. And then after that, that's when my operational stuff really, really started. So ironically, not until after I'd gone to school for a year and a half, after doing an ops tour in Germany and after a deployment where I didn't go into the Middle East. But um it's funny, man. Everything happens for a reason. And I'm actually grateful for the time we had that led up to my uh, operational time. So it, it all it all worked out in the end. I, I don't want I don't want to gloss over Neil uh, and, and where you were when you found out and what had happened. I mean, you know, um, this is March of 2003 that 
uh, Tack or Gar goes on. Um, but, you know, uh, can you sort of give me the background of what you knew? I mean, you guys were on the same team together. You mentioned it before, so you knew him well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, did you even so, know he was downrange? Like, how do you learn about how the events unfolded? What do you know? Yeah, so I was the uh, ops officer in Germany. So we fell under SOCIR. That's a Special Operations Command Europe. And we were very closely tracking uh, – what, what the guys were doing in Afghanistan and exactly where everyone was and all that. So, I mean, we, we definitely knew what was going on. We were providing uh, personnel and equipment to different locations, most of it going into Kandahar. Um, so I was in Germany when I found out about, uh, about Neil and about Roberts Ridge and about the whole aftermath of what happened at Tarker Gar. But um, yeah, Tough. I mean, you know, again, I uh, when you look back on it and and y- you understand how the events unfolded, uh, mm-hmm. is there anything that you reflect on and look at either as a bad decision from leadership or a bad military decision or something that that might have been able to have been done differently to maybe produce a different outcome or? Do you kind of look at it as, look, this is just what it is and it's the way it happens and it's combat and, and we accept that as the list of possible outcomes? Um, initially, I looked at it the second way you said, hey, it's combat, a lot of bad shit's going to happen. But as we started seeing all the after action reports and the hot washes and all the all the information flow that was happening inside NSW and across special operations, um, across the greater military, actually, there were so many lessons that came out of that um, operation that honestly changed a lot of how we uh, trained, changed how we communicated, changed how we planned. Um, A lot of good outcomes came out of a very, very bad situation. And, um, you know, I I, I think one, one of the one, one of the things that, uh, and it's not just an NSW thing, but it's so calm wide. Uh, we, we learn much better how to integrate with the conventional uh, force and how important uh, deconfliction is with all of the planning. Because he just, he just couldn't, we couldn't have national mission force doing something where the conventional military and the rest of SOCOM and partner forces not at least being aware of who's doing what in the battle space. That was a, that was a big lesson learned uh, out of that. Yeah. I mean, listen, uh, you know, joint operations has been around since the seventies, right? I mean, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Early seventies. Um, you know, and you learn your lesson from Eagle Claw. For those who don't know, that was the attempt to save the hostage crisis in, uh, in Iran, the attempt to, to, to go get the hostages and what a, mm-hmm. what a mess that was. Um, and I say all this to say, you know, uh, having spent time in, in, you know, the special operations community with, with, with the Green Berets um, and understanding that, you know, I, I have a small window into that whole thing about, you know, not only from a point, I, I mean, I can remember sitting in meetings with SEALs and Green Berets and everything else. And you're sitting there and you start to see this conglomeration of all these massive forces and getting them to speak the same language sometimes was just difficult. Uh, and then even yeah. at that, at your point, you know, uh, I'm a low level guy on the ground, but I'm out there running my own missions in other guys, battle spaces. And I can remember, you know, running up on other American forces, them trying to stop my convoy. And I'm sitting here like, you, know, I, you can't, this is our battle. You can't be here. I'm like, I, I don't, I, okay. That's, I don't really believe that that's how this works. I wear this <laughs> uniform. You do. I'm not here to hurt you. Let me go. Right. You know, right, like, right. Like that, you know, small. And again, you know, that's minor compared to what you're talking about, but it's just sort of, the evolution of joint operations, um, I, I don't think will ever stop. We're, depending on the, the conflict we're in and where we are and who we're up against and what the enemy brings to the table, I think we're all going to play a continual factor in how we conduct joint operations. But uh, yeah, lessons learned, I guess, right? <clears throat> yeah, lots lots of lessons learned, man. Holy cow. It's funny you bring up Tehran and the, uh, the, and the revolution and the hostage crisis, uh, we, we were we were living over there man I was a kid I was nine years old in 70 78 when really? all that when all that started we were uh, living in Tehran my dad was on an AT&T 
contract to completely uh, revamp the communications network in the, in the capital of Iran. Back when the Shah was there, I always like to talk about this stuff because I think a lot of people nowadays, they think of Iran as bad, bad, bad. But there are some incredible people there, man. And and we, uh, we had a great relationship with Iran before the Ayatollah got rid of the Shah and made him, made him leave. But uh, yeah, a little, little plug from my dad's book, Kuda Fez, Goodbye Iran. He wrote wow. a book during during COVID. Just great, great, great story about oh, our family and going look through Look what's going that. on there now. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah. they're on, they're on the brink of another revolution, uh, for, for a different reason. So, uh, yep. yep. Inshallah, Maybe. inshallah, as they say. Um, inshallah, inshallah. <laughs> okay. I, I, I want to spend one more, one more moment here with Neil. Um, you know, just because I want you to, to talk about how it affected you. Um, you know, mm. one, Obviously, you know, you, you lost a good friend and that is that that's got to be gut wrenching. Um, I assume it did not quell your appetite to get into the fight at all by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, does it change anything about your mindset because of what happened to Neil? Yeah, I think everybody goes through these different uh, 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 phases of grief, right? And anger is is definitely is definitely one of them in retribution. I think that was felt across the force, uh, not just for Neil, but all the incredible Americans that were lost in those few days. Um, yeah, it just makes you hungry, man. It makes you want to train harder. It makes you you and your team want to uh, be become better and more effective, and everybody uh, make becomes more focused and that's what we were feeling in in germany at the, at the time was holy shit this this just got real uh and um everybody was just fired up and fired up so uh when you are in germany uh it's obviously this is 03 you don't just chronologically I mean, you didn't go to graduate school before iraq right was that after yeah, I was it. I was in Monterey before I ever stepped foot in Iraq. Monterey, California. For yeah, grad, for grad school. Yeah, for freaking grad school. Okay, yeah. So yeah. Then take then then take me through because um, this is the the same time. Well, while we're sitting here talking about Neil, this is the same time you decide to swim the freaking English Channel. Yeah. I, I yeah. mean, how do you arrive at this genius idea? <laughs> Hey, I blame I blame Mike Troy for this. So I was a I was a middle distance sprinter growing up, and that's what I did at the uh, Air Force Academy. Um, and uh, you know, I was, I was a swimmer. That's kind of kind of what I knew. And uh, Mike was the one that said, "Hey, swim across the freaking English Channel." I'm like, Mike, uh, I don't know the first thing about marathon swimming. And he said something that always stuck with me. He said, uh, "He said, you know." No matter how hard it is, if you're doing it for a purpose bigger than yourself, uh, you will absolutely make it across. And then he said, if you have any question of whether this is the right thing to do, call his wife. And uh, that's what I did. I, uh, I called Patty. I was like, hey, I just got this crazy idea from my old swim coach, former team guy and all that. And uh, Patty, uh, it was an emotional conversation. But at the end of the day, she was like, yeah, please do it. Please do it. He would love it. I mean, look, if you're not comfortable sharing some of the details of it, I certainly understand. What made the conversation so emotional? Uh, that was that was my first time speaking with a Gold Star family oh. member. Yeah. And, and, and now, you know, jump, jump forward almost 20 years. Um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of those conversations. A lot of us had, but it, but at that point, that was my first time. And I was in Germany. So I was not at the memorial ceremony for Neil. And that was my first time talking to Patty since, since it all happened. And, um, her emotion, you know, just struck a chord with me. And I was like, Oh, fuck yeah, we're going, we're going to do this. I'm going to figure it out. I went back the next day. I went to NPS, the post-grad school. I said, Hey guys, I'm, 
I'm going to go do this thing over in Dover. I need you to all work with. I didn't ask. I told them. And, uh, and, and they, God, God bless them, man. They made it work. They uh, worked my schedule and whatever. And I was able to go over there and, um, and do it. Yeah. Did you tell any of your other team guys you were doing it? What's that? Did you tell any other, uh, any other team guys that you were doing it? Uh, yeah, the team guys at Monterey knew where I, I was doing it. The SF guys knew I was doing it and a uh, lot, a lot of support. I was going to say, did anybody um, object? Anybody think it's stupid? Anybody thought, thought it was like, you know? Yeah, probably my uh, parents, my wife, my sister, <laughs> my, yeah, yeah all, the, uh, all the family members that knew what, you know, knew my background in that sport and how tough it was going to be. But um, yeah, it was, it was a pretty crazy uh, experience. Uh, but I yeah. got to I got I to tell you, man, I because I had not been in combat, I just had this nervous energy in my life at that point. I had to freaking do something, man. I had to I had to do something. I couldn't get out of the orders that I was at. You know how the Navy works in the military. You know, they're not invitations. They're orders. They tell you to go do something. You're going to go do it. You're there for a year and a half. You just got to make the best of it. But uh, I needed the, the nervous energy I had in my life at that, at that point was crazy, crazy. So, uh, so I started training for it. And, uh, when I started training for it, that that's when I realized what, how, how, how tough it, it was going to be. That, that was, uh, that was interesting. Um, so just so everybody understands, you know, again, and I, I know this because I've had this conversation with you, you didn't just walk off the shore uh, on the English channel and said, I'll see you guys in France. Um, that's, that's not how it, did you, right. You went from England to France, right? Is that how you did it? On that yeah. Time? From Dover, uh, Dover to, uh, Calais or, uh, yeah, Dover, Dover is, to Calais, France. I say all this, there was a boat like, you know, traveling alongside you the whole way. Like, you know, you weren't left to your own devices, um, to become shark bait, uh, along the way, but, and, and you, it was, there were breaks in between, right? Like you stopped and, and, Got on the boat or ha tell me the whole deal again. Okay. The whole deal. I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it as quickly yeah, as summarize. I can. So, so, so you can't wear wetsuits. So there's no rubber for it to count as a, a official channel crossing. You can have on a speedo and a latex or rubber cap and earplugs. That's it. Um, you can throw on some Vaseline under your armpits and stuff if you want to do that, but for it to count, no rubber, no neoprene. So Monterey is a good place to train for that because the water temp is between 58 and 60 degrees. So and, uh, you, oh, dude. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, God. you know, it's, it's, it's good training temperature though. Oh, and before you can miserable. do he, oh, oh, trust me, dude. It, 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 I had no idea what I had gotten into because in order to even get uh, one of the pilot boat slots, you you have to have shown documentation that you've done a 10 hour immersion swim in water under 60 degrees. And I was like, OK, well, that that I guess that's going to have to be doable. I'll work my way up to it, thinking that I would be able to do that in a few months. So my first swim in Monterey uh, without rubber, I lasted. How long do you think I lasted, man? An hour. Five minutes. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Five minutes. And I started jackhammering in the water. I got in the truck, had the heater on whole, full blast for an hour, just sitting there. It, it was miserable. And the next time I, I, I made it like seven minutes. And the next time like 10. And it took me about six months to work up to a uh, what they called the immersion swim, which is the 10 hour immersion swim. And I did that up in San Francisco. But it, it gets back to that conversation we were having earlier of, of, about buds, man. It's it's amazing. What First of all, it's amazing how much your body can acclimate to something that's very uncomfortable. Cold water is just one example. I mean, I had been exposed to cold water at buds, of course. But uh, not for 10 hours straight. <laughs> no, God, no, no, no. I, and, and it's very controlled. It buds, you know, you got medics and doctors and stuff walking, especially during hell week. 
you know, they're walking, they're checking out your pupils, your speech patterns, they're asking you questions. So everybody's got a very tight hold on you. Uh, it was a little different when, uh, you know, I, I, I bring myself personally to that point of just on the verge of hyping out and then get out. And then the next day, try to go a little further, a little further, a little further. And it became a, 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 like a mental game, so to speak. And uh, it, it, it's amazing how powerful your mind is, because by the time you work your way up to that 10 hour immersion swim, you're, you, you, you have it. You, you have yourself completely convinced i'm i'm good to go i'll make it but uh yeah it's crazy the mind is so powerful man yeah um so when you start the swim itself you know um are are i don't know i mean what are you thinking like how, how do you how do you start it, it, you've done all the training so i don't think you thought you were going to fail but you know is there any point during the swim where you're going i might have bitten off more than i can chew no Okay. No, not at all. Because it's the same thing with buds. When you, when you, Hell Week's a great example, man. When you start Hell Week, you have to, and again, everybody does it a little bit different, but I would say 90% of the people, because we would all talk about it ahead of time. No matter what, I'm not going to ring the bell. Now, the reality is, is a lot of people end up ringing the bell, but that is the mindset you got to have. So for the channel swim, once I had done that immersion swim, I was like, all right, I, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to stop. Now, they might pull me. And if you truly hype out, they they, they will pull you. Um, but a very similar mind, mindset to, uh, you know, getting through something like Hell Week. How long and does I, it take you to get across? Uh, the yeah, it took me uh, 12 and a half, a little under 12 and a half hours, 12 hours, 24 minutes, I think it was. I mean, so 20, 21 miles is pro flies. You go mm -hmm. through two tidal shifts. So it looks like a, a big S on the chart. So crow straight line 21. Uh, I think our GPS was 37.3, 37 point something uh, miles. And so you can't, uh, why, you, why can't you do it straight? Just because the tide, the tide will shift you away or. Yeah. You might be swimming one knot this direction and the, and the current might be moving five knots the other direction. It's, it's one of those things where it's, it, it's nearly impossible to get across that channel without a pilot boat. And the pilot boats are all fishermen that are extremely uh, familiar with those tides and currents. Um, so you, you're not even aware of the current when you're swimming. What you are aware of is what the, what the winds are doing with the currents. Because about halfway across, we had the wind go in one direction against the current so no longer were we in swells but became this kind of chop and um yeah that's when it got that's when it got really uh interesting um i, I mean can you see anything underwater while you're doing this are you yeah, i mean yeah you, you, the, okay the, so the, like, this I, I would just say sorry to catch up like yeah i've run a marathon right you find uh -huh. yourself just gazing around to kill time, right? Just because it's better than recognizing my knees are killing me, my back hurts, I'm dehydrated. And, you know, like it, you just start looking around at whatever else is around you. What, do you. what are you looking at in the water? Well, for the first three hours, you're not, I wasn't looking at anything. It was pitch black because we uh, left Started at like three, three, yeah, 3 30, 4 in the morning, uh, just with the, the way the tides and currents were working that day. Um, and then as the sun starts coming up, you start, uh, yeah, I'd say the visibility was about 10 feet. And uh, as you go over these big, giant jellyfish, you, you just hope that you're not going to run into one of them. But it's weird, man. They, they float down below the water. So I never I never hit a single jellyfish. Uh, but some of those things got the size of like coffee tables. Pretty crazy. Wow. That's the only thing I saw. I saw a ton of jellyfish. And then you can hear the... <laughs> The, they have these high-speed ferries that go across back and forth from Calais, France to Dover. And these high-speed ferries are so damn loud. So when they're like two, three miles away, they sound like they're almost on top of you. So you hear a lot of that coming and going. And uh, yeah. Did you, uh, you, you see the boat that was tailing you the whole way? 
Yeah, you put it off to the side, whichever side you're breathing. If the wind's blowing, it's a diesel boat, so you don't want to be too close to it. But you want to be downwind of it, but not downwind behind where you're getting the fumes. Uh, but you try to use the boat to break down some of the chop. And, uh, the, and so when you breathe, you can see the boat. And if the boat starts getting too far away, you know you need to turn that, that direction. If the boat starts getting too close, you know you need to, to, right. to go the other direction. So, yeah, Do the you, pilot boat, it's not really a chase boat, but it's guiding you the entire right. way. Um, do you get a sense of how close you are to shore? Is there a way you can see, can tell that you're actually going <laughs> to do this? The one thing they tell you. When, when it, well, they tell you a bunch of shit, but the one, one of the things they tell you is whatever you do, don't look forward. Just swim. Just watch the pilot boat. That's all you need to look at. Don't look behind you. Don't look ahead of you. And then, you know, of course, uh, as you start getting, as we start getting close, the, the whole idea is to, I know we're deep diving on this, but it's kind of funny, man, this part. Right. Um, when the, that, the ideal swim, starts at Dover and ends at this point that sticks out about three quarters of a mile called Cape Grenet. That's where you want to hit, but it's very, very difficult to hit that exact point. But if you hit that point, that's the shortest point across the channel. But they tell you, whatever you do, don't look forward at those cliffs at Cape Grenet um, because it can be an illusion. And that's exactly what happened to me. I look up, and I see the cliffs of Cape Grenade. I was like, yes, we're getting close, man. And I, you know, I keep swimming for another five minutes. I look up again and, and there's the cliffs again, but they seem a little bit smaller. And I keep swimming. I look up and now they're definitely small. So you have this sensation when you miss it, like I did, uh, that you're swimming backwards. And it's a total mind screw with you, man. It misses with you. I mean, uh, just one more question on this whole thing. Well, two more, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a point where you stop actually, you know, doing your your regular freestyle swim stroke and just pick your head up and look around and then keep going again? Or are you just nonstop machine Energizer Bunny, just bam, 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 bam the whole way? You got you got to be Energizer Bunny because as soon as you stop, you start getting cold. So the water temp was 58 degrees. It's like 50, I think it was 57 in Dover and 59 when I finished uh, I kind of slowly warmed up going across, but as soon as you stop, everything starts, starts getting cold. So you have these feeding periods and uh, the way we did it is they would throw this polypro line out in front of me every 20 minutes. I'd swim over it, turn over on my back and start kicking like a banshee while I was downing like a water bottle full of whatever. So that way you're never, you never stop moving. Once you stop moving, you're done. Done. Um, you get it to the other side and you put your feet on the ground for the first time where you can walk, crawl. Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> where you can, where you can barely pull yourself onto shore. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's got to be the most amazing feeling in the world. Yeah, it was, it was really cool. But this week, this was right after Lance Armstrong had won. God, I don't know which tour it was he won, how many, you know. But uh, uh, I had this big American flag on the, the side of my cap, and I climb up on the beach, and I'm ready for all these guys to, you know, gather around me. Congratulations in French, you know, just big hugs and stuff. Mark, nothing, not a zip. There's there's like people on the beach, and they're just they're just scowling at me. <laughs> <laughs> um. And up on the cliffs, my uh, my wife, my mom, and two sons at the time. Ryan was a baby. Man, God bless Katie. Man, I don't know how she did this, but she, she went with me on this whole adventure and took our two boys, who at the time were uh, infant and two or three. And uh, they're up on the cliffs, and they're trying to navigate to where I'm going to finish. And I didn't even know they were there. I get on the beach. No reception. I'm looking around for Katie. I don't see her anywhere. A little, you know, unbeknownst to me, her and my mom and the two kids are, you know, clamoring down some trail about 100 yards away. I look around. There's nothing. Now I'm shivering. Now I'm cold. 
So I just squat on the beach, took a nice long leak that I've been holding for a long time. <laughs> Climb back in the water, swim back out to the boat, turn around, make our way back to Dover. Pretty uh, anticlimactic, I guess, huh? <laughs> yeah, until you get back to Dover and you go to the White Horse Pub, and if you complete a channel swim, mm -hmm. they, 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 they give you a free pint of Guinness. That's it. That's what you get for the whole experience. You get a pint of Guinness. There you, you go. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. You get to write your name on the wall and whatever. But um, there was a pay phone right outside the White Horse Pub. And uh, I had Patty's number with me. And, uh, and, I, and I called her. And um, I mean, it, it was a miserable experience until that point. And when I called Patty, oh man, it, you know, tears were flowing, man. It was just, it was really, uh, really a uh, special thing. It was cool. I can imagine. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's uh, purpose, right? Uh, yeah. Right there. That, 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 that describes the whole thing. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm so overwhelmed uh, by the whole entire thing. It's, it's just seems like insanity to a normal human like myself. Well, I'm not normal. Um, but you know, you get what you get my point to a, to a more, mere mortal being, uh, as me, uh, now that you're done playing Frankie to fish, um, <laughs> and you gotta go back to finish up grad school. Um, it, it's what's different about your mindset after the swim than before. Um, You, you know, one of, one of the things I, I got exposed to for the lead up to that swim was I really uh, wanted to raise money, resources, awareness for what um, guys were, were going through. Uh, not just the, the, the personnel, the warfighter themselves, but what the families were going through. Sure. And I, I, I can't tell you how many handwritten letters. I mean, this is in 2004, you know, yeah, there's email, but I got so many handwritten letters and I still have a lot of them um, just thanking me for what, what I was doing. And, you know, Monterey, south of, of San Francisco, and uh, they, the San Francisco Chronicle did a little piece like, hey, here's some guy. He's going to go swim the English Challenge. He's going to try to raise some money and awareness for this cause. And I remember seeing that article. First of all, I was uncomfortable being put in the article as, as okay, seal, John Doolittle. But I, I, I got over that pretty quick when I started getting these, these responses. Uh, first of all, the, the um, donations – that started rolling in this from the liberal Mecca of Western United States, San Francisco, California. I mean, I couldn't believe, it. I couldn't believe it. it people from oh God, hundreds of, of people were, were writing emails and sending checks and writing me personal uh, uh, notes of, of encouragement. And uh, I guess to get to your point, uh, the awareness of, how, how much of America, even in San Francisco, how much of America supported what our military uh, was was doing and, and undertaking yeah. as a result of of 9-11? It was overwhelming to me and it shifted a lot of things for me um, upstairs with how I approached life going forward. Were you were you still so um, you know chopping at the bit to get into combat after the swim? Did it quell any of that? Um, no, not really, because you know you 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 spend all this time and effort training for something, and right. um, you know, and it it sounds kind of warmongerish or whatever, but I mean, come on, man, you you spend your whole professional life, young adult life, uh. uh to go and do something, you, you just want to go and do it. You want to know go right. and do it. You just want to be tested. I mean, that's, you know, again, I don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's, 
now now like warmongering to certain people i don't think it is yeah and and knowing what i know now and knowing what we all know now i mean i now i would look back on my younger self and i'd say okay be careful what you ask for man because you you'll get it and, and you'll have some things to carry around with you for the rest of your life um but looking back on it all no oh, man, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't change I wouldn't change anything, man. Well, let's get to Iraq. Um, you you're finally there. Uh, you, you you've you've been called up to the big leagues. Uh, where are you? What's your mission? What are you guys charged with? I mean, I I kind of know, but for the sake of the audience. Um. Well, at the time, uh, Fallujah was run uh, by the Marines, so uh, I was uh, in a liaison position there with the Marine Corps. Uh, I was working with SODIF uh, West Special Operations Task Force uh, West. Um, and we were working uh, out of out of Fallujah. Um, I was not assigned to the team. I, I overlapped two NSW deployments. I wasn't assigned uh, to either of those teams. But due to the liaison job I was doing with the task force side and uh, the, the rest of soft and with the Marines, kind of that, that whole battlefield uh, deconflicting. Uh, that's, that's what my focus was on, on that first uh, deployment. And, uh, you know, be, team guys being team guys, you know, they bring me on missions and stuff. So it was cool, but I wasn't actually part of uh, either of those squadrons that were there. I was, I was in a liaison uh, position. Um, but, uh, fascinating job that the, uh, the battlefield deconflicting that was going on was, was incredible. I, I, I had no idea, you know, before that deployment, I wasn't a huge fan of the Marines for, you know, various reasons. It's kind of how you're <laughs> bred into NSW after that deployment. Holy crap. I have the most incredible respect for that organization very professional, very good at what they do. And they actually changed a lot of how we approached mission planning. Before 9-11, our mission planning cycle was like 72, 96 hours. After working with the Marines, um, they, they had this thing called the R2P2, Rapid Response Planning Process. I might have that acronym wrong, but Rapid Response. And it was like something that happened and within six hours, we would launch. And it was game-changing approach. And uh, a lot a lot changed uh, for me, how, how I approached planning and all that kind of stuff after that deployment. Okay, so, but it goes back to the simple question. If you're in a liaison role, my guess is, again, you're not with any of the team guys. You're sitting in a talk and in an operations center and uh, in a lot of meetings and and part and parceling things out, you're not actually in combat yet. Well, it is interesting. The, uh, the, let's see, the general Gaskin was the, uh, operations guy. And then he shared that role with general Allen, John Allen, who later became a uh, CENTCOM commander yeah. and general Allen had this thing in, uh, in Fallujah. He would headquartered it out of Fallujah and it was called his helo diplomacy tour. So uh, every three days, he would load up uh, a chopper, a couple choppers. He'd go to Ramadi. He'd load up the government of Iraq, Governor Mamoun at the time in Ramadi. Uh, and he'd load up Governor Mamoun's whole entourage onto a couple birds. And then he would fly, let's just say, to Al Qaim out at the Syrian border, fly all of the so, so the Western Euphrates Valley, uh, uh, the capital out there was Ramadi. Governor Mamoun was in Ramadi. And he'd take all that governance out to, in this case, let's say, al -Qaim. And he'd land on the ground and he'd take me with him. So I, every time he did this, I got to go with him. And watching the local tribal elders have these conversations with Governor Mamoon and the, and the local governance. And I mean, it would be yelling and screaming. And, and, but at the end of the day, what, and, and 
I attribute a lot of this to General uh, Allen. His whole point was without the support of the tribal elders, what the governance in Ramadi is trying to do is never going to happen. Never. So th this, it, it was crazy successful, man. He, he would get those governance guys to sit in the room with the elders. And at the end of the day, the concurrence nine times out of 10 would be like, look, we, we just, we just got to get rid of Al Qaeda, man. We're going to continue losing all our, 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 our young men and our children to suicide bombing or whatever else Al Qaeda has got them doing. We got to get rid of Al Qaeda. And, and, you know, initially the tribal elders thought that they could take care of it themselves with the local uh, population. But once things started really going crazy in, um, in that part of Iraq, they realized they need some, uh, some help from the, the local governance and the coalition forces. So, it it um you remember the the awakening and all that at that at that time um i attribute a lot of that success to what uh allen was to what general allen was was doing at the time so while i was not on that deployment involved in uh direct combat uh it was very valuable to see how operationally uh, relevant, I guess we 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 could be as a coalition to help change the momentum of what was going on. All right, um, that deployment ends. You get back. Now we're in 2007 time frame, right? Uh, late 2006, early 2007, somewhere in that window. Mm -hmm. What's next? Yep. Uh, my next deployment was uh, out of uh, SOCOM. So I was working at SOCOM and. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have a whole lot of uh, operational combat experience. And so the, the community said, hey, John, we need you to uh, uh, go overseas again, go be the deputy commander for Siege of Sotov AP out of Balad, Iraq. Um, Siege of Sotov, that's a combined joint special operations it's task force, force for Arabian, Arabian, Arabian Peninsula. Peninsula. Yeah. So that was my command, and, baby. That's where I fell under. Oh, uh, Siege of Sotov AP, AP, man. Hey, there man. And, uh, it was a good know, old APOAE, the, the, the Army Post Office. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's what the AE stands for, but anyway, uh, yeah, that's uh, CJ. That was, uh, that, that was being run at the time by 5th Group. Um, yep. And uh, so, I, so I worked under 5th Group for that deployment. And, um, you know, again. Who was there? Who was in Balad at that time? Who, who was running CJ sort of? Uh, it was an 06, right? Or was it a one star? Yep. yep. Is is uh, 06. I don't know if I should throw his name out there. Okay. I haven't yeah, talked to him. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it was all it was all the fifth group guys. Yeah. And uh well, I, I, God, I, I man. those guys on my deployment. They were the bulk of my deployment. Was uh, oh dude, those guys are great, man. They were getting after it. Getting after it, man. Really impressed with those guys. So, um, Balad, you know, again, LSA Anaconda, uh, for those, uh, regular mm -hmm. army uh, military folks who are there. Um, are you guys doing kinetic action at this point in time? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it, right? I, I, I was, I was in the, the deputy commander position, but, uh, every night, <coughs> excuse me, every night, um, there was something going on every night. And it was in that era. You guys also, you know, went went outside of a lot too, right? Well, remember, Siege Soap AP was the, the entire Arabian Peninsula. So all of SOF, whether it was NSW or SF or MARSOC or whoever, they all reported to that command. So it was tracking everything that Every, was, that right, was yeah. going on. And, um, you know, I never, I, ne I never realized until that point, until working with those guys, the fifth group guys, I never uh, realized um, how hard the SF guys had it after after 9-11 for years after 9-11, uh, oh, man. Fifth group was the was the first group oh. on Afghanistan. I mean, there there were there were Green Berets who, uh, you know, you're talking about in the beginning of the invasion. Two dudes sitting on a mountaintop calling on airstrikes nonstop by themselves for days on end, waiting for relief. 
I mean, that's, that's... those, those to, to use a Navy term, those guys were port and starboard for the longest time, man. Six months at home, six months gone, six months home, six months gone. And when they were home, they weren't necessarily home. They were because a lot of training was away from home station for those guys. And, uh, and, and, and I know a lot of, well, and, and just for the background, part of that, you know, each each FS group is assigned a region of the world. Fifth group has Southwest Asia. That's their area of expertise. So that was natural that they were the first group to go. Uh, and and uh, it was it, it made sense that they were, you know, part of that whole deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they just they, the, those guys deployed a lot. My, yeah. my hat's off. Uh, all, all of SF, all of soft, but li- li- being part of a, a, an SF group for deployment was uh, very eye-opening for me. Yeah. What, um, I mean, it, it, is this where you get your first true taste of, you know, kicking indoors kind of combat? No, that was that was in Fallujah because the guys would take me on. You know, they they felt bad for me, man. When I was at that in, in that Fallujah thing, there's like, God, you're hanging out with freaking General Allen and and the Marines, and you're doing staff stuff at the talk, man. Come with us, come out tonight, and you know. So they they would do that a lot, and that was that that was fun, and got 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 you know got got some stuff going on with that. Um, but the Balada deployment, you know, kind kind. Some of the same thing, you know, I'd get on the bird and fly out to see different guys. But uh, it, at the end of the day, yeah, brother, it was still it was still staff. I mean, it was combat staff, but it was still staff work, man. Do you um, do you get an appreciation for how difficult combat can be at times? I mean, and, and I guess I asked that question under the under the guise of, you know, uh, what difficult task you had just completed swimming across the English channel. It's, you know, is there a way to compare the two as far as the difficulty? No. Com- combat is the hardest thing um, a human will ever go through. In my opinion, Why? Uh, you, 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 you take the lack of sleep, you pile on the stress you pile on that cumulative subconcussive act or issue that almost all of the guys are dealing with. So just as a quick sidebar, think of a concussion, right? If you're in a 24 month cycle and you go on a deployment, you get your bell rung a couple times and you come home and you're home for a year and a half, you're going to be you know, more often than not, you're going to be, you're going to be fine. Your body's going to have an opportunity to recover. When, when guys came, when after 9-11, when guys, when the deployments turned kinetic and the, and, and the guys were uh, getting their bell rung a lot, you know, just from breaching alone. Um, and then they go home and now you don't have that year and a half to, for your body and your brain to recover. Now it's only six months, but that, that six months is in no way, shape or form truly a recovery because you're taking a year and a half of workup training and squeezing it into those six months. So the guys were just gone all the time. And when they were gone, they were training, they were training hard and everything counts. Every time you fire a Carl Gustav, a law rocket, every time you open a canopy and a free fall jump, everything, all of those are, are, are little concussive events to the brain. So you have blast over pressurization, you have concussive events. So that was an issue, man. Now back to your, your, your original question. Um, so now guys are on these deployments, these repeated, you know, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And they're, they're, they're not getting, the opportunity to kind of come out of that hypervigilance state. You know, you have your parasympathetic and your sympathetic, sympathetic being fight or flight. Um, it takes time to come out of fight or flight. It takes time to get out of that hypervigilance state when you're on deployment. And so now stress, concuss, concussions, blast injury, sleep, disrupted sleep cycles, sleep dysrhythmia, all this shit 
happening um, at, at once. And um, it starts to become a real issue for the force. And I don't think it all really started coming to a head until like 08. Um, I think that was about the time that Admiral Olson was like, um, and he was a SOCOM commander at the time. And he was like, hey, we are getting a lot of uh, feedback on alcohol-related incidents, um, um, abuse, um, just a lot of things happening. Like, they're starting to have a steady climb across the force of what was going on. And um, I think that when Admiral Olsen uh, pushed out these teams around the force to see, kind of kind of take um, the temperature on the force and the families to feel out what was going on, I think that's when everyone started to realize, okay, we, we, we can't, we can't keep going at this pace. We're going to quite literally kill ourselves. Um, so it, it was a, uh, 08, 09 was, was an interesting time. And then when, when Admiral McRaven came in, uh, to so come after, uh, Admiral Olson or, and, and, and Olson hands McRaven, Hey, this, this is the pressure on the force that we found during all this, you know, peeling the onion back on the force, handed it to Admiral McRaven. Admiral McRaven said, okay, let's, let's do something with this. And that's where uh, the acronym preservation of the force and family came from. And uh, I'd love to talk about that a little bit too with you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know a hundred percent because it, it obviously leads into a lot of what you're doing in your post-military career. Um, but for your for your personal combat experience, you know, um, I, I see you have this sort of semi dramatic pause before, to use an appropriate term, you engage the conversation. What what is the pause like? There's what are you prepping yourself for? What what go, what's going on in your mind when 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 I ask about your combat experience? Uh, I don't think I really was was in it. Till uh, till Afghanistan, oh, Afghanistan in, okay. in, in, in 2010, and that was a uh, a year long uh, deployment working with uh, um, the the Pol- in the Polish battle space in Ghazni in Ghazni province, and that's where I really became aware of the whole hyper vigilance thing and my sleep cycle and all that stuff that that year. That was uh that 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 was kind of froggy. It took me a while to come back from that one. So, give me an experience there that stands out to you in Afghanistan, like you know one that just when when you have a sort of thought that brings you back, that flashes you back. Where 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 is it taking you? Oh wow. We, we could go on for hours. I know. I, listen, I, 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 <laughs> but there are two or three for me that are just constantly top of mind, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there was uh, uh, one that I thought was a pretty, uh, a pretty good one. Uh, I, I was working uh, up in uh, Fob Ghazni, and uh, we had access to a uh, caravan of vehicles. Um, and we had access. We had our own wrecker uh, truck, and there was a uh, a small group of guys down near the Zabel border, uh, just uh, right outside Fob Warrior, right at the at the border between Ghazni yep. and Zabel. And um, and there were guys. Uh, it was like they were um, they were southwest of Fob Warrior, and they were and they were pinned down. And the reason they were pinned down is they had an MRAP that they were told they could not uh, abandon. Uh, well, they didn't really have the ability to abandon it because that was that was their ride. And um, so they were kind of pinned down. They were pinned down. And the guys at, um, at Warrior didn't have a wrecker and they didn't have the ability, uh, apparently, to go go out and get them. So uh, we had that ability at Fob Gosney, but the problem was that that was like a, a three and a half hour uh, drive uh, down there. 
over uh, sketchy terrain and along Highway One. Highway One was that that um, that road that went from Kandahar to Kabul. And if you draw a line from Kandahar to Kabul, right in the middle is Ghazni Province, and uh, uh, that that road goes north to south all the way through the province. And it was, you know, IED alley. There were uh, 300 and some odd uh, culverts on that road. And uh, as, as your listeners know, the culverts are where the IEDs, uh, nine times out of 10, that's where they put the IEDs. And, uh, you know, whenever we rolled as a convoy, uh, we, we, we'd usually, if it was daylight, we'd have the AMP, the Afghan National Police with us, and they would roll in front of us. And they would physically, this was kind of cool, man, uh, Colonel Zelawar Zahid. He's passed away when he made general. He got in that con. He got in that tick and uh, he got killed. But his his guys, the the A and P, would roll in front of us in broad daylight, and they would crawl down in these culverts to see if there was an ID in there. Un freaking believable. Um, that's a whole nother story. Yeah, those, those but, are um, human human MRAP. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know the RCT guys, the route clearance team guys. They would roll uh, on these culverts and purposefully uh, either detonate them with the uh, the rollers that they'd uh, put out in front of their trucks, uh, or um, they'd find them uh, and have EOD go and blow them in place type thing. Um, but the the AMP guys, Colonel uh, Zelawar Zahid's guys, uh, they they would just drive in front of us and they'd find them. And they'd wave us down and they'd have us drive around. They'd give us the big X, you know, showing an ID. And um, that was just incredible. But in this this scenario, the guys that were pinned down down near the uh, Zabal border, um, we needed to go at night. So A&P wasn't wasn't an option. Uh, RCT wasn't an option because the guys were in trouble and we had to get down there fast. And, uh, that was, that was froggy, man. That was uh drive on highway one, three and a half hours, high speed, middle of the night and, um, get down there. And the guys, the guys did awesome and, uh, drove a wrecker down there. And as the sun, uh, was coming up, we, uh, we were able to, uh, uh, kind of surround the, the guys that were pinned down. Uh, we took the wrecker, we hooked up the MRAP that was just completely destroyed and um, got them, got them all out of there. And, um, and, and, and the, the crazy part of that whole story is there were only a couple of team guys on that convoy uh, it, that was a provincial reconstruction team tour. So I, I was the CEO of a, a PRT, yep. and um, so I, I I was a frogman. The senior enlisted was a frogman. We had some frogmen that were working with the Polish Grom there locally that were with us on that op. Uh, I think we might have had two, one or two Gr- Groms, the Polish uh, kind of our counterparts in Poland, total, total studs. And I love those guys. Um, but the vast majority of what we brought down there to do that was uh, Boston National Guard, um, our uh, uh, our civil affairs team, our engineers, our, you know, these were not soft operators, but uh, I, they were able to do a pretty, a pretty much a soft uh, operation and crush it, man. I'm really proud of those guys. Um, but we had a, we had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of, uh, froggy incidences, uh, like that. And, you know, it was, it was good. Every, was, every now and then us regular yeah. army pukes can step up and do things, uh, that, that, uh, were not expected. So, you know, uh, <laughs> Hey man, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, man, not, our senior chief, I'm not going to throw his name out there, but from day one, when he was with that PRT, his goal was to be able to get them on nods, driving on nod, do all the stuff that we would uh, work up, uh, do it, doing a workup with land warfare. He's like, Hey, I'm, these aren't, they're not going to be team guys, but we're going to do some team guy stuff. And uh, um, yeah, Tim, if you ever, if you ever listen to this brother, I really appreciate what you did. 
because uh, you, you saved a lot of cats by that that training. That was awesome. Yeah, good stuff. Um, so the the Afghan experience in and of itself is 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 the most trying one for you when it comes to to combat. Um, when when you look back on that experience. Um, not that necessarily is there anything you could have done different. I, I, I do always ask the question, though, do you wish you had allowed yourself more decompression time while on deployment? Right. Because it's the one thing we never did. I mean, none of us ever said, well, I'm not going out today. I need a break. You know, uh, somebody else will take you. No, ma'am. No, when, when, when you're even even a 12 month long one, when when you're when you're in it, I, the the inner back back to that that energy you're just it's so it's so high you just never really feel right. that not none of us did um i look back on it now and i realize you know there there were probably some things we probably should have taken a step back and and taken a knee um but man when you're when you're in it it's uh it's just go 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 um but to your question um, after that deployment, I should have taken some time off. I, I went from that CO tour to right into another CO tour. And, um, it, yeah, man. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Even, did you not know that she, were you not aware that you needed time? And if you had been, do you think you would have asked for it anyway? I don't think at that time I knew. I, I I don't think I knew I needed some some downtime. This was uh, that that deployment was summer ten to summer eleven, and it wasn't until uh, December twelve. And uh, we we got to talk about this. I think this is important. Um, and we come back to it if you want. Oh, go ahead. Uh, away. In uh in in December. Uh, 2012 uh that's when a good friend of mine died by suicide downrange and right. when that happened we as a community um we we as a community we we had dealt with a lot of uh stuff leading up to that of course and suicide was part of it but for me personally when that happened, that was like, holy shit, what is going on? Because this guy was one of the most resilient dudes I knew. And um, and he was a commanding officer, and leading troops in combat. You know, it's kind of the pinnacle of any SEAL officers, uh, the commanding officer downrange getting after it. Uh, his 14th deployment. And um, anyway, when that happened... I think all of us kind of took a step back going, okay, now wait a minute. If that dude had a breaking point, we probably all collectively have a breaking point. And um, so to your earlier question, um, yeah, I, I, I needed some time down after that one year Ghazni deployment and I didn't give it to myself, but I don't think I knew at the time uh, how important. But genuinely, really do, you, do you really think, even if you knew, do you think you would have given it to yourself? Do you think you would have went to your command and said, look, I'm not, I can't take this next CO assignment. I, I, I can't do it. I, I've got to get my head on straight. Oh, after, after Joe killed himself? Oh, no. Hell yeah. Well, yeah, after that, after Joe had, but I'm saying you had, you had said you jumped from that one Afghanistan assignment right to the other one and didn't take a break. Um, am I getting things correct chronologically? What I'm saying is if you had recognized after the Afghanistan deployment that you needed a break, do you genuinely believe you would have said to your command, I need a timeout? Even if you knew that you did, I, I, it's, 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 it's not, and again, good, bad, or indifferent, it's not really in our DNA to ask for, you know, let me take a knee here on this next assignment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a hard que question to answer because after having gone through uh, Job's gig and after having done 
the pot of gig and being uh, uh, exposed to all the family issues and all the suicides and all the suicide ideations and all that stuff, my answer would be, of course, I would ask for a break. But you're asking right back after that high adventure 12 months. Um, no, I just I just I just didn't know. And it, knowing what I know now, yes, sure. I would have I would have appropriately uh, said, hey, can, can I take can, can I take something that's going to give me a little more downtime? Um, but it doesn't work that way. You know, I think it works that way now better than it was, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but it's a constant challenge. Um you know, yeah, it's did did the did the suicide of your friend um, make you have a desire to leave the organization? Did I mean, did you want did you realize that, you know, irreparable irreparable damage may have been done that, you know, you, you didn't need to live this life anymore? No, no, I, I wanted to try and help. I wanted to try and help. I wanted to do what I could inside the organization to try and uh, help avoid that from happening um, again. Now, you know, for your listeners, the guy we're talking about um, went to the Air Force Academy with me. His name's Joe Price. Uh, I was a 92 guy. He was a 93 guy. We were both at SEAL Team 2 together. So we both did the inter-service transfer. Uh, he was a year junior than me, but he went through BUDS before me. And um, we, were, we, we, we were close. And, it, and at the time, I was the CO in December 12 at our unit in Germany. He was the CO downrange, SEAL Team 4. And he had a task unit working for me. And I had guys working for him in Afghanistan. So we would have these face phone conversations kind of like this uh, once a week. And um, during that deployment, um, some some things went uh, really south and uh, his team uh, lost uh, a couple guys and um, three, exactly three. And um, Job uh, blamed himself a lot for that. And I remember having these conversations with him and, and he wasn't sleeping well. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of details I don't want to go into uh, on, 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 in, in, in this podcast. Uh, but suffice to say, he, he was blaming himself a lot for, uh, for what happened. But he wasn't sleeping. He stopped working out and... Um, Yeah. Anyway, I, 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 every every time we talk about Job, I get I get sidetracked, man, because that that was a, that was a tough one for me for me personally. Um, well, I he mean, drove. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You know, yeah. Let's let's just kind of put some background to it. You know, it's it's what happened with Job was it was in late 2012. Um, you know, we are at war now for a decade straight um and the level of op tempo is off the charts especially in the special operations community which has already been asked to do a ton but to this point in combat yeah. is asked to do more than it ever has for longer than it ever has in any period of special operations in american history that's just a fact of the matter and nobody ever bothered to stop and say we're pushing these guys too hard. In fact, they did the exact opposite. We need more. We need more. We need more. We need more. So much so that we started trying to create more special forces. Right. Um, yeah, you're right. And so, you know, um, it was on a deployment that just wasn't very fruitful, I guess is a fair way to say it. Right. Um, you know, there, there, there were people who had, uh, there, there were other people who had, had, called it cursed uh, and I'm quoting from an article I read on all this um, called it a cursed deployment. Um, and I can't speak to that. I'm just, you know, quoting the article. I say all that to say that, you know, um, leaders when they are in a position um, and, and commanders, when they are in a position of taking care of others, 
and that starts to go wrong, internally we are always going to blame ourselves. The good leaders are right there. There's there's a there's a crop of people who will play the blame game and plausible deniability, and it's not my fault and everything else. And you know, uh, I, I've learned this in the latter part of my career. If you aren't willing to accept the very worst of headlines and outcomes when you take command, then don't do it, period. If you are not willing to accept the very worst of outcomes and say, that's on me, three simple words, that's on me. If you can't do that and don't agree to do that, then don't take command, period. Because ultimately, that's the only right answer to when things go wrong. Not, well, this, not, well, oh, if X would happen. No, oh, I didn't get the resources I needed. Those aren't the answers we're looking for. We're looking for, that's on me. And the people who believe that, accept that burden and take it within the depths of their soul. There's no way you're going to convince them that it's not on them. No matter how much was out of their control, out of their decision-making process, everything else, it's still, that's on me. That is the responsibility that many of us assume. And again, never having met Job, and I don't know, and I haven't, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the prologue, so to speak, to you on this. But I can only assume that um, it's that sort of weight that ultimately led to the decision down the road where he decided to take his own life. Yeah, I think a big takeaway from that whole uh, experience was, uh, at least for me, was um, it. everybody's got a breaking point. Everybody's got a breaking point. I mean, Job was, he was the go-to guy, man. He was the first to raise his hand every time they needed something um, when he was, I don't want to go too much into the operational details but he he was the send me guy and people knew that and people liked working working with joe he was funny as all get out and he was just operationally sound and guys liked working for him and the 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 fact that somebody like job uh was able to break like that i think that was a big aha moment for a lot of us that uh, God, if it can happen with him, it can happen with anybody. And it really caused a lot of us to kind of uh, uh, peel the onion a little bit on what we were putting the force through. And then back 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 to that, you know, that very compressed workup cycle, and a lot of exposure to blast TBI and cumulative subconcussive issues. Thinking brain health here. Um, and that was in 2012, December 22nd, 2012. And that, and it's not just that one event. There were other suicides with family members. There were suicides with operators. There were suicides with veterans. Of course, we all know about that. Uh, but there wasn't a whole lot of um, awareness of what was going on in the active duty force with suicide ideation and completed suicides. And um, it was around that time, so call it early 2013, when, um, you know, we, we, we really started getting a lot of support from uh, Congress with, because uh, in, in 2012, SOCOM as a force had the highest um, now you gotta be careful with you using the word rate. Right. Um, but you know, SOCOM now is about 73,000 personnel at the time. I think it was like 69,000 personnel, but as a rate of active duty personnel in the organization of call it 69,000, um, it was the highest completed suicide rate of any government organization in 2012. And I'm caught talking about outside the military as well, USAID, the agency, everything. The highest suicide rate was 2012, and it was SOCOM. And that's when I was in the uh, 
uh, well, soon after that's when I was in the POTIF gig. It was actually a buddy of mine, Tom, was in it at that time. But that's when we really started to see support from Congress. It was like, okay, wait a minute. How can we help alleviate this? And um, there's a lot of things that, that came out of that, but the biggest was money. And the money uh, went to putting resources inside operational commands. And the resources uh, were a lot of things uh, on the physical side. So think strength, conditioning coach, PTs, uh, uh, sports psychologists, things like that. But more on the behavioral health side, we started seeing uh, the ability to embed um, counselors, LCSWs, licensed clinical social workers, operational psychologists, not just active duty, but contracted resources in that world and embedding those resources into operational commands. I think that truly started to turn the tide because then what you started to see was inside a command, uh, having a counselor inside that command and, and then the commander or the senior enlisted advisor leveraging that counselor, the more junior guys and, and gals seeing the leadership leveraging that helping resource. And then that helped with the stigma of guys getting care. You know, th this whole idea, uh, you know, early on when we started seeing some of these active duty suicides happening, this whole idea of, well, we'll just have people go see the shrink. Well, going to see the shrink meant getting in your car, driving across the base, waiting in a line, you know, that whole thing. And guys just didn't want to do it. And they refused. And I understand why they refused, you know, because that, that 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 idea of being tainted and taken off the line. But when you took those resources and sorry, man, I'm kind of on a soapbox here. But when you took those resources and you embedded them in the command and in the male, female counselors and psychologists that were using the gyms and using the same chow hall and in the hallways with the guys then the trust, the trust factor was built and people started using those. And it's, it's a constant, it's a long road and it continues. Um, but that really started in 2000, I'd say 13 is when we really started to see uh, the benefits of, of that. And um, yeah, that, that's helped a lot. All right. So you have, you know, loss at this point in your career between Neil Roberts, Joe Price, you know, um, that is, that is very, very close to home. Uh, Lots of guys. Lots yeah. of guys. And it just the two that we've talked about. Um, and you start to see, you know, you start to, even if you're not realizing we're still, you, you, you're showing us, you know, all the post concussive blasts and everything else and, and all that. And everything is cumulative, right? There's, there's no escaping it. There's the, it's all compounding to one another. You're, you're not, you they're not separate incidents anymore. At this point, they are all related in some size, way, shape, or form. Um, mm -hmm. Before you end up taking the job at POTUS, um, are you thinking that I've had too much? I've, I, I've you know, uh, are you starting to realize that the weight of all this is you need to transfer your focus from this part of your career to a different part? Yeah, I mean, when I came back from that Gosney deployment, that was that was it, it actually was over 12 months because there was some other stuff that we were gone for. So I came back from that and uh, my middle son, uh, Ryan, pulls me aside and goes, hey, dad, can you not do that again? Maybe because you missed two of my birthdays. <laughs> and that's when I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. And I had forgotten about one of them, uh, but he was right. I missed his birthday twice. And I think that was kind of the, uh, that was the beginning of, okay, maybe this train is uh, nearing the, the final station for me. Um, so when I went to that POTIF job, I knew that was the last job I was doing. When I went to SOCOM and did that, that POTIF gig, I knew that that was my last thing. I didn't know what was going to be next, but I knew we would be retiring out of SOCOM here in uh, Tampa, Florida. Um, is that where you're going with it? Well, no, yeah. I mean, I guess it was just more more of, um, I, I probably phrased the question poorly. It, it, 
you realize, did you realize that the combat stress to you had put you to a breaking point where you needed to exfil from that and, and change and do something else? Um, but I, th I think, you know, what you find is that you were able to pivot into the perfect job that you needed to, not only for, to, so, to quote, take an E, but also to, to give you validity and, and sort of um, pre prevent and head off some of the problems that the force was looking at at this point in time. Yeah. And, and ironically, uh, I was dealing with some of those, uh, issues myself and, um, you know, for about the four years after getting back from that last one to include the next CO tour, um, my sleep cycle was never right. I never, for those four years, I never slept or never say never, but I rarely slept past three three thirty in the morning i just i was just on this weird thing where at three thirty in the morning i was up wheels turning everything going and that's when my day it didn't matter if i went to bed at midnight or eight o'clock at three o'clock in the morning three thirty that's just kind of when i was up and um you know a lot of uh, uh <laughs> interesting things happened along that road uh, but a couple of them drove me to finally agreeing, OK, I, I, I need I need some some treatment or professional help or what have you. And uh, so I went into an a, a inpatient program at James Haley, VA up in North Tampa. And uh, that was that was a godsend, man, because I did not realize how jacked up I was. Um but that that that's part of the journey, right? I think I think uh, a a lot of guys go a while and not realizing how how bad it really is for them. And uh, once I got the sleep better, everything got better. And that's that's one of the things I always tell tell people is uh, if you if you've been in this world for five years or thirty five years, it doesn't matter. You the the sleep piece, in my opinion, is the most important thing to get back on track because if the sleep gets back on track the short-term memory gets back on track the blast injury the you know the, the the concussive syndrome everything gets better um but um and i did that while i was at at socom before i got out and uh, it prepped me for transitioning out of the military uh but i'd encourage guys that while they're still in get fixed whether you're talking orthopedically or mental health behavioral health um get as fixed as possible before you get out because once you're out it's very hard man especially if you start going into another career because all of our uh i don't know our our natural inclination is we're, we're type alpha foot on the gas the foot's either on the gas or it's off and when you transition out of the military uh, most of us are going to put our foot on the gas because we want to succeed and we want our new team to appreciate us and we want our new team to value us. And the way you do that is you put your foot all the way down on the gas and you go. And that's a problem if you leave the military and you're not good upstairs, physically, mentally, you got to be good. And I, 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 I appreciate what the military's done over the years to help prepare people for that transition um some of the programs have been good some have been failures i get it uh but one of the success stories i think is this whole skill bridge program are you aware of what that is no okay so skill bridge is a way while you're still active duty to go and become kind of like an intern for some company it used to be only like one or two companies in all of America did steel bridge and uh, the command had to release you in order to do it. Uh, but like way at the beginning, Microsoft was one of them. So you could go work at Microsoft for four months, six months or whatever, not get paid. It was kind of like an internship, but you were getting paid because you were still on the military's dime. And it, it was a way to help uh, bridge that transition to civilian life. Um, the skill bridge program, from what I understand now, is pretty significant. And um, most of the commands are working with uh, personnel to give them that opportunity. So it's 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 pretty powerful and it helps. But that's just one way. 
um, to get yourself physically and, and psychologically ready for a whole nother career, basically, because most people, when they get out, you know, they're in their fifties, man, they got, they got, they got, they get still have a lot to give. You know, that's the, that's the world I found myself in. I was in my late forties. I'm 53 now. I've been out for five and a half years and uh, yeah, it's, it's valuable to prepare yourself as much as possible. And that preparation really starts like a year before you're done, if not sooner. Yeah, uh, going through it now, so I can. Uh, I, I Are just, you? Hey, well, congratulations on your promotion, by the way, man. I yeah, I mean, I, I'm uh, between you and me and the Hazard Ground community. I'm, I'm bummed about the next promotion I'm not getting, but uh, uh, mm. you know, that's that's a uh, it's a whole different conversation. You just got to get in the in the right mind frame that uh, uh, not becoming a flag officer is not a failure. <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. Yeah, well, you know, it's there may be some of that too. Um, yeah, yeah. When 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 you do it as long as we have, and you go go go, and you don't know any other gear, um, when someone tells you you have to stop and you don't get to, you know, make that decision on your own, it, it you feel a little bit helpless and a little bit lost. Um, but in the same respect, you know, a, a mentor of mine and a former guest here. On the show, I reference him often because he's, he's a re really, really sharp guy, Mike Jason. But he said to me, he goes, for the first time in your entire military career, you get to call the shots. So take advantage of it. You decide how this ends. You yeah. tell them where you want it to go and what you want to do and how you want it to end. And people will willfully accept you as you start walking out the door. So uh, got to figure out what that looks like. Got to figure out, you know, when the end is, um, you know, but uh, it's uh, – it's a wake up call. It's, it's a different sort of wake up call, you know, um, when, when you have to start planning for a life outside of a uniform that you've put on for more of your life than not. Right. Yeah. Uh, if, yeah. if, if you're like me and you, and, and even if you don't include my ROTC time still, I've been in uniform for over 50% of my life. I don't know a life without it. Uh, but eventually I'm going to, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yeah could have figured out um so you, you you speaking of which you retire you take off the uniform and you know you're done you've done the potive thing and, and you still have this sort of strong desire to to give back and help and, and want to do other things um i know you're associated with the navy seal foundation and the the, the frogman swim um mm -hmm. and also we mentioned at the top of the show katsu so how does all this shake out for you over the course of the next you know once you hang it up officially how does it shake out to, to get all these things in place well, um, thanks for bringing up the Frogman swim. That's uh, that's that's near and dear to my heart, man. That's here locally. Uh, quick story: um, uh, Dan Knossen, uh Frogman, uh, lost both legs above the knees. When that happened, that was during one of my tours. It um, and uh, it, it, it's so common. There was a small community uh, of us that came together, and we wanted to kind of raise some money for that family. We heard that the Knossen family could, could use some help. And um, so that's what we did. We put together a little swim across the bay, you know, not when you hear Tampa Bay, Frog, it's, it's not all the way across Tampa. It's just from the point of St. Pete where the Gandy Bridge is and head over about 5K, so a little over three miles to the Tampa Peninsula that SOCOM's on. And um, so some of us got together. And the idea was we were hoping we could kind of have a check of about three grand to hand to the family. And um, so we all kind of reached out to our Christmas card list or whatever, you know, just friends and family and uh, said, hey, I'm going to do this thing. Try to raise some resources for this guy who just lost both legs. Total stud, by the way. Um, so that's that's what we did. We finished the swim. And it's, it's great. We're at the American Legion uh, over in Tampa. And uh, wads of cash are coming out of pockets, handwritten checks, IOUs on bar napkins, all this stuff. And it gets put on table. And, and uh, this guy, Dan, starts, starts going through and adding it all up. And it wasn't three grand. It ended up being about $30,000. Wow. And this is like 14 years ago. And we're, we're like... Whoa, 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 wait a minute. What 
what just happened? And it was that realization that there is a lot of people that we all know, you know, friends and family. I call it the Christmas card list. You know, the the people that you kind of are in contact with, but not all the time. But at least once a year, you reach out to them. And what we decided to do was go with one of the nonprofits, one of the organizations that uh, uh, could help us build this up. And uh, it just happened to be the the SEAL Foundation, Naval, Navy SEAL Foundation, nothing against the other foundation. There's so many foundations doing incredible stuff. It's just that at that time, that's what we decided. That's what made sense. So that's what we did. Um, so they agreed to kind of subsidize these swims and, you know, pay for the party afterwards and that kind of stuff. And what happened is each year we started inviting more and more Gold Star families to the swim. So what, what the way it works is early in the morning, it's in January when it's freaking cold. Um, well, cold for Florida. Yeah. It start, Yeah. So it, it starts on the Gandhi side. We do a memorial service of reading of all the names of the fallen Naval Special Warfare operators uh, that we've lost since 9-11. We got to cut it off somewhere. So since 9-11, the reading of the names, there's a memorial ceremony. The sun's coming up. The SOCOM jump team jumps in. Um, then the swim starts. Every swimmer's got a kayaker. But to do the swim, each swimmer has to agree to raise at least $2,000 for the Navy SEAL Foundation. And that money is earmarked to help with Gold Star families. So surviving spouses and kids. Um, but what happens is most of the people, cause we cut it off at 150 people, 150 swimmers, 150 kayakers, 300 people in the water. We figure from a safety perspective, that's about, <laughs> that's about max. And, uh, what's happened is each year the swim makes more and more and more. And, uh, this last January was the 14th iteration. Two of them got canceled for weather, but we still kept the fundraising going. And, uh, this last, uh, last January, we made it, we made a ton of money for, for the foundation, uh, north of a million dollars. And then, um, after the swim, uh, we have party at Hula Bay. That's a bar in Tampa. And, uh, this last uh, last swim, we had uh, 25 Gold Star families, so about 75 Gold Star personnel uh, there at the finish line and at the party. And it's, it's freaking awesome, man. It It is so cool to see these Gold Star family members that no longer have their son or their husband or their dad anymore interacting uh, with team guys and team guy families and just the Naval special warfare community in general to see them all interacting, um, memorializing, um, their loved ones sacrifice to this nation. It's just, it's just incredible. And, and you really, it really hammers home the sacrifice, not of the fallen, but the sacrifice of the families. It is truly one of the coolest things I'm involved with. And, um, I'm so grateful for, uh, Guys like uh, uh, Kurt Ott and Dan O'Shea and um, Rory O'Connor and his son, rest in peace, Tom O'Connor, who helped start this thing, and Terry Tomlin, rest in peace. And I don't know what it is, but a lot of guys have died associated with swim, but it's just uh, freaking amazing, man. Thanks for letting me talk about it for a no, minute. No, I, I mean, I, listen, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, how do you balance? the mission and the job of soft it's Navy SEALs, but you know, in general soft, because I think in some size, way, shape or form, they're all the similar, but different and the same, but not. Um, but how do you balance that mission, the requirements of that mission um, with the, with the side effects of being one of those individuals and find a way to keep them the sharpest point of the spear without breaking the spear. Are you talking about me personally? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, you, you've worked, you, you had the job with the preservation of, of the, fa the, the, the force and the families, right. 
you're mm-hmm. working with with veterans now, amputees and everything else, and you see all these these gold stars. You 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 know what happened to your friends. Um, it's not about what you can do different. It's it's what could have been done different. It's what are we doing different now to prevent these things? What steps are we taking in a preventative measure to make sure that they can still be as combat effective as we need them to be without personally becoming ineffective? So how do, how do we do that? Uh, I, I, I think uh, I, I can speak to the SOCOM community by saying sure. – uh, a, a way we can that we have made guys more effective, uh, more resilient is the is this whole human performance uh, program because all of the poda it falls under the human performance umbrella. And uh, you know if, if things were in place 20, 30 years ago when we were going through training and, and we were going through workups uh, that are in place now, guys would not be nearly as broken, nearly as broken. And I'm talking psychologically as well as physically. Uh, The whole approach to uh, mental and physical health is so much better now than it was. So, I I, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say, hey, you know, there's all these things that still need to be done to, to make it all better. I mean, of course, you can always make it better. But it is so much better right now, Mark, than, than it was just as recent as 10 years ago. Um, sure. Let, let, me, let, me, let me counter with this. Okay. Does the, does the – I'll ask the question this way. Does the, does the need to care for the person soften the warrior's ability to be as good as they are? Because, look, I mean – the fact of the matter is, is that some of this is counterintuitive. We're there to train killers. We're there to train people who can do things that nobody else in this world can do. And there is a, it's a fair question to ask. I think those people are, have a certain mental makeup that the rest of the population doesn't, which is why it's small and why it's elite. If you okay. start giving them the same treatment that the rest of the population gets, that sort of detracts from that eliteness if you will, or doesn't it? I guess that you understand what I'm asking now. Yeah, I think I think I disagree with you, man, because okay. I, I I I I think when uh, when you, when you take somebody that's in that world, mm-hmm. um, that was developed a long time ago. That whole training cycle, the whole way we create an assessment selection, create a special operations uh, soldier or warrior. That was developed a long time ago when guys would, I mean, the average deployment, the average number of deployments in Vietnam uh, was two, right? And so, ma- major- a lot of guys just did one, you know, they were drafted and they did one deployment. A lot of guys were not drafted and they did two or some that were drafted went and did three, you know, Mike Troy volunteered, did three deployments. That was a lot back then. Okay. Job had 14. That was in 2012. There's guys out there that have 18 plus combat deployments. And if we learned, if we didn't learn anything from Joe, we absolutely learned this. I don't care how much of a stud you are. I don't care how resilient you are or how resilient you think you are. Every human body and every brain has a breaking point. And knowing that and understanding that, um, now mandates us as a nation to, in some ways, protect the guys from themselves. And that's where this soft care, uh, not so, soft, but, but to use your word, the, the softer side of the care, it's, it's super important, super right. valuable. So and it I, makes the guys more effective. I think the answer is, is that, you know, when you say, you know, you have to protect them from themselves, the idea is that in a macro level, I'm not going to, you know, you're not getting 14 deployments. Why? Because I'm going to make sure you don't get 14 deployments on a macro level. You're just, your unit is physically going to take a break that way. Much like it's crazy how he had 14 and it took you forever just to get one. Right. Like that's, there's an imbalance there that shouldn't be given the nature of the assignment. So in a roundabout way, we got to the answer I was looking for, or at least, you know, you gave me an answer I was satisfied with um, that, you know, we have 
it's big, big military's job, big Navy, big Army, you know, big DOD, their job to ensure that, look, you know, we need to protect these folks who don't know how to say no from themselves. To a degree, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's fair. I mean, I, you know, again, I, yeah. and it should be put on them. In reality, it should. But um, in, in the crossroads of political and diplomatic wishes, um, as war is a continual physical extension of politics, um, you know, the guy in the suit doesn't want to lose. The guy in the Pentagon doesn't want to lose. The guy on the ground, was it there? They have different goals. They have different. They have different wins. They have different ideologies. And and that gap. Look, the the bottom line is, you can. You're never going to bridge that gap. Period. It's it's right. it's impassable. They're right. never going to be the same thing. They're never going to want the same thing. So, the the idea, the best you can do is make the impasse something you can jump, or a reasonable human can jump. Right. Um, because you're not going to bridge it. It, it, it's just impossible. Yeah, it's tough. It's, it, it's, it, it's a tough problem. But, you know, hey, man, we've, we've been in, in sustained combat operations for well over 20 years, and it's never, ever happened in this country, in this country's history. So th there's a bit of building the airplane as we fly it going on right now. Yeah. And um, and the the behavioral health mental health of the force and i'm talking military wide is absolutely an essential continuing conversation uh that that needs to happen because this whole 22 a day or whatever the number is now a, a lot of that data comes from the vietnam veteran uh population so my opinion is that number is going to keep going up. And as a nation, man, we got to work our ass off to do everything we can for for these men and women that have not done an average of two deployments, but have done a lot more. Um, give me the uh, give me the elevator speech on, on Katsu. <laughs> uh, I had thir I've had 13 orthopedic uh, surgeries. And uh, my, the, the last two I had when I was at SOCOM, the, uh, the PT there, hey, Jim, how you doing, brother? Uh, he uh, was the first one to introduce me to Katsu. Uh, they used it for uh, two of my uh, uh, orthopedic rehabs. And it's just a way of tricking the body into thinking it's working much harder than it is. So this is a device that you wear that it creates pneumatic elastic pressure in these bands. These bands are not tourniquets. They're elastic pneumatic bands. I know a lot of your listeners are listening and not watching, but I have the band in my hand and it's designed to give and move with the limb. So you put these things on up high on your arms or the leg bands are bigger. You wear them up high on your legs. And what happens is that device puts pressure in this elastic pneumatic band for 30 seconds, and then it releases it for five. And then 10 millimeters mercury higher pressure goes into the bands for another 30 seconds and then releases it. And it happens over and over and over again automatically. You don't have to think about it. You just put these things on and then you start doing any kind of movement when the limb is fully engorged with blood a, again, not a tourniquet. We're not cutting off blood. We're actually stretching open tissue. And I've when done you move something like that, this. blood restriction therapy, BRT, yeah, B, B, BFR, blood, BFR. blood flow restriction, BFR. Blood flow restriction, yeah. So yeah. this this is the original BFR that came out of Japan uh, in the seventies. It's like so one of those. Used, for those people, I mean, just so so I've done. Basically, you put these bands around, and then they ask you to. Do, like they say, do 10 squats real quick and you do 10 squats and then they put the bands on and they say, do 10 squats again. And by the seventh, you're like, oh my God, I can't stand up. Exactly. Like, exactly. Your body exactly. weight yeah. feels like two, an, an extra 225 on your shoulders. Yep. But the beauty for, for orthopedic rehab and for the docs, the reason they love it is you're getting the metabolic or you're getting a hormonal and metabolic response of moving heavy weight, but you're not straining the skeletal system. That's why the rehab guys love it. 
But that's not why it was developed in Japan initially. Initially, it was all about that's the oldest demographic on the planet. It's a crazy aging population. It was developed to eliminate sarcopenia. That's the muscle wasting as you age. It was developed to help the aging population in Japan and for cardiac rehab. Uh, the, the, the outcome measures that came from all that are why the orthopedic rehab guys got interested in it. And now it's, I mean, it's a global movement. We have like 40 knockoff products out there in the industry. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been, it's yeah. been crazy, but I love it because on the wounded warrior aspect, it helps with residual limb discomfort and pain to include phantom limb pain. So if you have a, 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 a limb that's amputated and you wear this above the limb, you're engorging all that capillary, all that vascular tissue around the nerve endings and the brain treats it as intense exercise at the residual limb, which helps with a lot of the um, neuropathic pain. So it's I've learned a lot about anatomy <laughs> while being in this job. But I love it, man. It's it's great company. It's helping a lot of my teammates. It helps with uh, sleep. That's a whole nother conversation. Flight dysrhythmia and jet lag. Um, the International Olympic Committee is using it uh, with a lot of the governing bodies as a recovery uh, device. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot to it. But uh, for your listeners, katsu.com, K-A-A-T-S-U. Dot com katsu.com and uh yeah mark we should make you a freaking uh affiliate brother i i, I, I <laughs> welcome i mean your tagline katsu you gots to there you go um you, you gots to <laughs> katsu you gots to so uh ja- japanese word ka means increase atsu means pressure so so think like shiatsu atsu uh, is pressure there we so go ka increase atsu pressure nice well, JD, look, uh, you know, uh, it's been too long since we last did this, uh, and, and it's great for you to share your story again. And you know, um, I had genuinely forgotten how much, uh, God, you know, twenty five years a lot, man. You know, and and everything that you did in it, and uh, you know, the, the, obviously the Channel Swim and, and all that. I mean, and blessings to your wife and your kids because she's still around. Your three kids are almost all in college now, and you know, you've you've uh, a lot of people, a lot of families don't survive 25 years of what you have gone through. So credit to your wife and your kids uh, and, and you, obviously, for for holding it all together and now thriving in, in a post-military life. Because I think that, you know, if you write down wins, if you go back and talk to your, your 18, 21-year-old self and say, you know, I'm going to give you all the wins that you want to get out of your military career, family intact, wife intact, you know, spouse intact, whatever it may be. Um, are the ones that I think that we we don't share enough of those wins. So so blessings to her. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Mark. It's uh, she she's she's amazing. She's a godsend. I'm I'm glad she never dumped me along the way. Um, you know, I or watched you drown around on the English Channel. Neither, neither one. <laughs> well, that that was a challenge. That was a challenge. <laughs> But uh, she's just been absolutely incredible. We have three wonderful kids. One's a sophomore at UCF. One's a freshman at Auburn. And one's a sophomore here locally in high school. And um, yeah, absolutely, man. I, I, you know, I, I do a lot of public speaking. And I always close it with a picture of my family and a picture of a bunch of friends on, on a beach here locally with the sun setting. And I always tell people, um, you know, when, when all this military stuff's done, when all this industry, work, professional, career, whatever, when all of it's done, all you have is your faith, your family, and your friends. So no matter how busy you get in your professional life and your professional career, and this applies to you, Mark. No matter how busy it all gets, especially as you transition out of the military, keep all that stuff in mind and don't let those relationships atrophy because when it's all done, um, that's that's all you got, brother. 
So um, to your listeners, faith, family, friends, I always got to throw the faith in there as a good Catholic boy. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, I'll close it with this, if you don't mind. This is a little self-promoting uh, plug here. Um, if you are at a university, at a college, at a, a service academy, at an ROTC unit, at a Boy Scout unit, whatever, um, go to johndoolittle.com, J-O-H-N-D-O-O-L-I-T-T-L-E. That's my name, johndoolittle.com. And I do pro bono um, speaking to all those uh, kind of groups because uh, it, I just flew back from the Air Force Academy uh, yesterday and I got to speak to the class of 2025. It's the second time I've done this. And you want to, you want to talk about uh, a cool feeling talking to people. And I was in their seats 33 years ago, talking to them and being able to say, Hey, man, this is stuff that I wish somebody had told me, uh, in their case, 33 years earlier, that nobody told me when I was in those chairs. Um, that's gold, and it's a cool way to pay it forward. So uh, I, I love doing that. Well, again, johndoolittle.com, uh, great place of information to learn more about you, um, and, you know, speaking events and everything else. But look, uh, I... I I'm glad that we hey, we got a chance to do this. I'm certainly, you know, uh, as 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 a friend and somebody who kind of looks up to you a little bit for everything that you've done throughout your career. Um, you know, I'm I'm always enthused uh, to for you to share your story because it has so much value. Um, there's so many highs and lows, and and getting through them all is never an easy thing to navigate. Um, and and I think that, you know. Uh, when you put the, the, this sort of diversity and dichotomy of the things you've done throughout your entire career together, uh, it all seems to make sense and ends up in, in a spot where you're still giving back all these years later. And, and that to me is, is the ultimate sign that you've taken something valuable from your career, uh, and, and your life and, and are, are paying it forward. Right. Uh, cause it's the best thing that we, it, we can't always continue to serve in uniform as we've discussed before, but we can always continue to right. serve. And I think right. that's, something that is is paramount for us so you know i think everybody wants to man i would I hope everybody, so everybody everybody that served in, in in some capacity in this country when that piece of your career is over that's that leaves a gaping hole in your yeah. psyche and i think everybody wants to keep doing it in some in some way so katsu and public speaking have been that for me and uh yeah, I thank God for that company, man, because they I've had some tough times over just these last five and a half years, and they've always been there for me, always been there for me. So find find a good company to work with when you get out. It's uh, it's important. Keep good company around you. And on that note, uh, we'll, we'll say uh, sayonara is Japanese, I think. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. John Doolittle, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.